Yeah, you're welcome for making me feel as uncomfortable as possible to start your sermon today. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that. Jim, can you back me down a little bit up here? It might be loud here. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that before, um, but I have never seen it. I knew about it, um, and watching it for the first time to get it ready for the sermon, it still makes me uncomfortable. Like, it's so long. If you didn't catch what happened there, that was the Miss Universe pageant in 2015. Steve Harvey was hired to MC it, and at the end, your job is to take the two people who are left and tell which one the winner is. And he told the first runner-up that she had won her dream, that she had worked her whole life for, and they put a crown on her head, and they put a sash over it. And from what I can guess, based on the way she was reacting, I have a feeling she doesn't speak much English, because when there was more cheering after he said, I have, I have, a, Mr. I have made a mistake, or I need to, I need to, to I apologize, people like, like sort of freak out, scream, yell, because they were like, oh my gosh, this can't be happening. She thought it was more cheers for her, and she's like overwhelmed, and I'm like, that lady, can you feel weird for Miss Philippines? Because she's like, am I supposed to come up there? Like, and then they cut the screen. Did they take the crown off the head of her? Like, like, oh my gosh. Like, what are you doing? And so I bring this up because the title of my sermon today is she had one job to do, dude. Seriously? All you had to do was announce the winner. That's what they hired you for. And this is what you come up with. That was all. Now, one of the best things about being up here and and talking is that usually it's just a platform for me to tell you about how dumb I am and how I need to work on stuff and then if you guys learn something from it, all right. Um, I've had many of those moments in my life and I'm going to share one with you. Um, if you didn't know this, I'm in a DJ company. I've been a DJ for a really, really long time. I don't do it very much anymore considering all the other stuff that goes on. My wife and children like to see me once in a while. But I've done a lot of high school dances and weddings and all that kind of stuff. One day somebody asked me if I did weddings and I'm like, okay, yeah, I do weddings. And I learned with a lot of bumps and bruises along the way how to DJ weddings. And one of my, you only had one job to do stories, which there are actually probably several in the wedding situation, is, is a bride and groom hires me to use the DJ voice, and make the music happen, and make the grand entrance special. And, and to backtrack a little bit, when I, when I get a bride and groom to decide they want to use me for a wedding, I have this little wedding reception planner, and I have them come fill out. And I get all varying different levels of involvement. Uh, a lot of times I'll have a bride who comes, the groom is somewhere else, or, or that's, that's not my thing, babe. I took care of that. I'm sure it'll be cool. Uh, or we'll get you know, the groom and the bride that come together and they're both a little interested. Sometimes you get both are hugely interested and care an awful lot about the music. And then sometimes you, you'll get a, you know, a bridezilla where you know, I, I have like the bride is there and anytime the husband says anything, the, the future husband says anything, she's and he's like, no, oh, okay, it's whatever you want, it's cool. And, and then like they're on their phone and like they're passing the phone to me of their mom. So that their mom goes, well, is that, and this is a year before the wedding. Like, because we meet like a year ahead of time. So if you're gonna get married in J month, you need to book your DJ ahead of time. Just a little tip for anybody out there waiting to get married. J month, busy. You got a good DJ, you gotta book at least a year in advance. So, so they're here and, and they sit down with me and they talk about it. And one of the things that happens generally is after that moment is over with, I tell them anytime you need something, you got me for the rest of the year. If you have a question, you want to change something. Everything's digital now. You know, if you need to change something, even up to the last moment, probably like that, I can make that happen for you. So sometimes a lot of brides communicate with me. And at this wedding in particular, I had a bride that was a good communicator. She had some things that she wasn't sure what they were going to do. She said she'd get back to me. So she kept emailing um, and she called and whatnot. And I had her phone number programmed in my phone. And so she would email and I would see her name. And she would text the phone and see her name, and email and see her name, and text the phone and see her name, and I see her name, and I see her name. So, get to the wedding, and we are at a beautiful ballroom that they have spent a lot of money on, with like a 250 guests, and this is my time, it's got the mic, i got the suit, and I do the DJ voice, and I, and I introduce the bridal party, and then I introduce the best man in the maid of honor, and I say, ladies and gentlemen, get up out of your seat, put your hands together, and make some noise, as I introduce you to our host and host of the evening, the brand new Mr. and Mrs. Her Last Name. <laughs> oh yeah, and it cool to like, ah, like Michael Puffer and people, ah, except normal people are like, yeah, and all of a sudden they're like, oh. and there's like this gasp on one side, and what makes it even better is the whole other side is laughing, and it's, it's a weird laugh, because for the last three months, I come to find out later, um, they've been telling him how she wears the pants in the family, <laughs> <laughs> even though this is a, it is a modern world, and you can you could take her last name on that, but they told me, and I had it written down somewhere, Mr. and Mrs. his last name. And so he's gotten over it, I think. Um, but much like Steve Harvey, um, there's nowhere to hide. Because next is the toast, and I have to bring the microphone out them in front of everybody. People are just looking at me. And then other people are like, 
And you just look at him like, dude, you get one job. How do you screw that up? And so, as I was thinking about what we're going to preach on, I was thinking, what if I get to heaven, and Jesus is up there, and he's kind of hanging out, and, and there's some angels around there, and I get up there, and I'm like, so am I in, or am I in? And he's like, dude, you were down for like 30 seconds. You had one job to do, seriously? That's what you did with it? And I'm like, oh. And so I thought, I wonder what that one job is, because I want to make sure I get it right. And if I'm going to get a chance to talk to anybody else about it, I'd like to make sure they get the job right. And so Rick read that scripture verse for us. It was called the Great Commission. And I wonder if we get it. Because we hear this Great Commission, and it's big fancy language. And, and a lot of the books, if you've been uh, making the mistake, or the great challenge of reading like the old King James Version of the Bible, sometimes we can get real confused with some of the kingdom language they use in there. And, and it seems overwhelming to say, I'm going to go to all the places in the world, I'm going to take that on. But I think because of that, a lot of us have just fallen in the trap of just, shit, it's whatever. And I think Satan's done a really good job in the world of making everybody think that politically correct equals, no, I just don't want to mess with that or bother anybody with it, so I'll just not do it. And it's like the end all for like, well, I don't want to bother anybody by pushing my faith on them, so I'm just going to let everybody else do their thing. A guy named Bill Bright, who co-founded the Campus Crusade for Christ, said that most Christians have never taken this commandment seriously. We've been playing games while our world is in flames. We are like men and women who are straightening pictures on the walls of a burning building. We are dealing with peripheral issues when the hearts of people that need to be or their hearts of people that need to be changed. The problems in the world that are threatening to engulf humanity can only be solved through faith in Christ and obedience to his commands. And and I think there's kind of a seriousness in that. That we really have this world that you guys have seen. I don't even want to watch the news anymore. And the answer to it is Jesus. And I really believe that. And, and it's like, the answer is Jesus. But the answer to it is being like Jesus. And doing the things he has. And that's why he made that statement. About, this is my final command. This is my drop. That's when Jesus went out. Literally, he floated to heaven after that. Like, that was what he left us with. And that's the one job we have. And yet we're here just going, eh, I don't really need to do that. And so, I want to put it to you like this. Let's say that. It's almost getting to lunch time. Choose this. That would be awesome. Let's say that I make ribs. Now, the ribs I make aren't barbecue ribs. There's something you've never had before. They got this like rosemary and the seasoning and there's some marinade and you smell it like, what is that? I need it. And then you get to try it. Oh my gosh, Paul, these are the greatest things I've ever had. And you like cinch in your head for like weeks and you're like, when are those happening again? I need that. Right? And, and, and so people are like, you need to share those ribs with the world. Go get you a food truck and a nice one. You take it to fairs and festivals and, and and you cook the ribs, and you share that, and the people of the world will be better for knowing your ribs. And I'm like, yes, and Denise is like, let's do this. And so we get an awesome, shiny food truck, and Denise makes it all like uh, hipster cool with stuff on it. And Pete, it just looks like, you know, I want whatever they sell, I want that. And then we find a place that, that lets the, the pigs like roam around like a playground with the sprinklers, and they're happy before we eat and, and, them. Uh, and so we get this thing, and, and we get like, we're going to take this seriously. This is important because it's changed the world with these ribs. I'm going to get the manual from the food truck and the manual for all of the, like, the equipment of the food truck, and, and we're going to read it. Denise is going to read it with me, and we're going to break it down and talk about each part of it. And then, you know, the kids are part of this. We've got three girls. They all should probably be part of it. So we're going to break down the manual, and I'm going to draw like a picture version of it for them and show them how all the components to the engine work and how like the, the, the oven works. And then, after a while, we're cooking and we're doing this stuff, and I'm so excited about it, I'm so in love with this food truck idea, that I even start writing poetry about this, the ribs and the food trucks. And I'm saying the poems, and of course the kids are learning the poems at night, and we're musical, so McKenna just starts humming some stuff and saying, I'm like, we should play the guitar, we put the poems to words, and so we're singing our songs about the ribs and the food truck, and, and it's fun, our family is just loving it, and we're eating the ribs, and every once in a while we invite some of our friends and family over to have the ribs, they don't get leftovers though, just what's here. But then we never, ever, ever take the food truck anywhere. It just sits in our driveway. We never sell the ribs, we never share the ribs, we never make a name for our company, and it just sits in the driveway. It's still glorious, isn't it? But you wouldn't know. You've never had my ribs. You would never know because it's never going to be anywhere, and no one else will ever know that. And that's kind of like, I think, the way a lot of us look at church. This is a cool place. It's got cool instruments and speakers. And at Christmas, we have all kinds of decorations up. And 
We'll put money into it. People love it. We'll even take the book, the instruction manual. We break it down into pieces and have smart people talk about it. And we'll watch videos on it. We'll, we'll write poetry. And we'll put it to music. And we'll even sing some of that music. And, and we'll love it. But what good is all this awesome if it just stays right here? Because the reason why we would be willing to do that, I don't know why you come here, but I come here because Jesus made a difference in my life. And I like being here around other people who feel that way, who tell me things like, yeah, you can do this, you can do that, and I got that love and I feel it, and it makes me energized. I'm going to keep that energy to myself and not share that with anybody else because I don't want anybody else to know about this. That seems a little weird. So I'm trying to think, why would people who love Jesus, who know Jesus, who are trying to find out Jesus, who have got this in there, that for some reason are feeling pulled here, that have had that change, why would we not tell people? And so I really think it breaks down to something that I probably just keep preaching on all the time because I feel it in me, is we don't feel good enough. And I, I can't speak for all of you, but I'll speak for me. Most of the time I feel like, what are you doing putting me up here? I shouldn't even be back there with the guitar. Why are you choosing me to be up here to do this? With all the things I do wrong, all the mistakes I make, all the times I drift and don't do, and the times I doubt, why are you doing that? And I think, how many people sit there going, you would never want me to do this. You would never be able to use me to do this. Do you know who I am? And to that, I tell you, you may never have heard the real story of the Bible before. Because it's easy to listen to a few pastors read some things or to get a Max Lucado book or, or something along those lines and it sort of interprets scripture for you, but it never really breaks it down. I'm going to tell you something about your God and my God and your Jesus and my Jesus. He's backwards, upside down, if you will. If you go to the Old Testament, even I was calling the angry God because in the Old Testament that's where like people were bad and he's all like, you get in the boat, everybody else drowns. Like just angry stuff. And then you're like, wow, that guy can't like anybody. But that God... He didn't choose the kings and the royalty. In fact, he didn't even want most of it when he picked it. People demanded it. He gave them kings. He chose people like Moses, who was abandoned and orphaned, then murdered somebody, then ran away and hid for 40 years. And then afterwards, he comes out as like a goat herder kind of guy, and then he saves all of Egypt. He picks David, which, real quick history lesson, anything Old Testament, if you're a son... The only one who inherits anything is the oldest son. So you have seven sons, the rest of them have to figure out their own life. They don't get to inherit dad's fortune. So when you're the youngest of all the sons, like David was, you're a nobody. And that's who God picked to slay Goliath and then eventually become the greatest king in Israel. Fast forward a little bit. I don't know if any of you guys have kids or not, but like when we got a kid, I had to wonder, like, you really are trusting me with this? If you want a whole human to be my job? That's not a good idea. And then you think he's sending the Son of God, he's sending God in human form to earth, and he picks somebody? Who would you pick for your kid? I'd be thinking, okay, there's no air conditioning back then, people sleep on dirt huts, everybody's dying of weird diseases. I'm picking someone with a walled fortress, castle with servants and doctors and healthy stuff, and they're going to have all kinds of food to eat, they're never going to be a famine or drought where they're at, they'll be, that's where I want to go. Who does he pick? He picks a teenage girl named Mary who's going to be married to a carpenter in a piddly little town in Israel. That's who he puts the king of all earth into. And then when Jesus gets here, who does Jesus pick? Jesus is supposed to be changing the world with his message. He never intended to do anything else. You look at any other religion, most of the major players and most of the major empires are trying to fight people for stuff. Jesus doesn't even want to start a religion. He's just here to talk to people. Now, if you had a plan to spread your word... I don't know about you, but if I want to spread my word and I can do cool stuff, I'd go straight to LeBron. I'd be like, see that? Back to life. Like, Whoa! And I'd like, tell people. Because it's LeBron. Everybody would listen. Jesus doesn't find LeBron. He doesn't go to celebrities. He goes to a prostitute by a well. He goes to a man who nobody else even looked at because he's got leprosy. He goes to people who haven't ever walked, people who can't see. He returns your sight and tells them, shh, don't tell anybody. How do you spread a message like that? Because he's backwards. He's upside down. He even says it in Scripture. You want to be first in heaven, you need to be last here. Put yourself at the end. That's how you get to go places. <laughs> so you think you can't change anything? You think you're too little or too broken or too weak to make a difference? I tell you, an African proverb that says, you don't think you can change anything because you're too little? Try spending a night in your bedroom with a mosquito. Think about it for a second, seriously. You ever been in a bedroom with a mosquito? That's infuriating. <laughs> I've been in one, like just a big bedroom, and it just is always with the buzzing in the ear. You smack yourself in the head, and it hurts. 
and you never hit it, and it keeps coming back, and you go, you know what, I quit, and you go somewhere else because it's in there. Like, that makes a difference. It's this little. You can make a difference. Now, I'm going to show you another video. I don't usually do a lot of videos, but this week I did, and this one, um, I don't know, I get emotional. I don't know why. I just love this guy. There's a guy named Fred, and he won an award for Lifetime Achievement on TV. And Emmy. And he's going to ask you, well, he's going to ask the audience, but I'd like you to participate if you don't mind. I want you to listen to what he says, but I want, I want you to also, when he asks the audience, to give him 10 seconds. Why don't you do what he, he says? I think it might make a difference in your morning. So let's see what I don't know if he was your neighbor or I know he was mine for a while. I just love when he tells the little shoe he put it on. He sang his little song. And I don't know if you got a little bit of a tear for yourself when you thought about the people that made a difference in you. And I want to tell you that. I want to tell you that the Great Commission always sounds overwhelming because it says, go to all nations, and every single person I've ever met sits here and goes, I don't have time to go to the city of Uganda, and I can't get away from my family to go to Guatemala, and I'm here to tell you that while those are amazing things, and that is part of going to all nations, that what Jesus was speaking about, you're there. Can you imagine telling the disciples that they would have people who know the words they said across an ocean they didn't know existed on a continent that they'd never seen before? This is all nations. Right where you are in the place that you live is all nations. Your job, the one job that you have, is to be who you are to the best of your ability. Because you don't get to be someone like that without all the little people along the way. You don't have to change everything. It's not your job to go out and find somebody and tell them all about Jesus and then bring them to church and then you baptize them yourself and then you make sure they grow in faith. It's your job to be the you that you are because the most difference I've made in my life has come from being able to be broken for people and to tell them who I am. I don't go in people's faces. I'm not up in their face every day going, you don't know Jesus, you're going to burn. You better learn. <coughs> But people ask me, well, you want to hang out tomorrow? We're going to do this. And I go, not until afternoon because I'll be at church tomorrow. And I make sure they know that's where I'm at. And then when people ask me where I'm going on Wednesday, I'm like, oh, i got a staff meeting after church. Or after work, i got to get there. And I make sure that people know clearly. And even though I'm not a pastor now, but I was a pastor before, before I was that, um, people at school used to call me Preacher Paul or Pastor Paul because they'd always, they'd always look at me and go, oh, I can't talk about that in front of Paul. And I made it clear who I was. And I didn't brag about it. I didn't make people feel bad. I just told them, you know what happens when you let people know who you are? They come to you and they ask you things when they need something. Because most of them won't come here. Most people are hurt and afraid. And you know who they look at and think have it all together? You. You who think you don't have it together. Who think your life is falling apart. They see you and go, man, I wish our life was that good. I wish we understood things like those guys do. And one day they're going to come to you if you let them. And they're going to ask you for help. And they're going to say, hey, I, you know what? Why do you go to church? It's stupid. Why do you believe in that stuff? And you guys think you're perfect? And then you're going to laugh and you're going to go, I'm perfect. And then something that happened to you, something in your life, something about who you are. Like Denise and I talked to you guys about our marriage. I've told you lots of times. I hope that it's helped people. But I can't fix everything. It's not my job. But being able to share that with people gives them a chance to go, wow, I thought you guys had it all together. And I go, we don't. We don't know what we're doing. But we're here. And being in this place and watching what Jesus has done for us makes me want to tell other people what he can do for them. So when you look at this great commission, you go, I can't do that. I don't know what I'm doing. You don't have to do anything other than be what you are. But be it for Jesus. Recognize that every day you're being called to live your life for him. You're being called to be what you are and all your brokenness and all your hurt and all of what you have for somebody else. Because they may never come here, ever. But your comments, your words, your love, your generosity, your kindness, you're not flipping somebody off when they cut you off and lay something that you do. Maybe the thing that makes them go, maybe they have something I need to care about. And maybe that, friends, will be that little thing that when somebody gets up there one day, because I wouldn't be here without these people, and they think back on those people that got them step by step, go to you. Because when you think maybe you don't do anything, 
Maybe when you're at school and you think that nobody's watching or the kids don't do anything with this. I'm in middle school, I'm in high school, what am I going to do? I don't do anything like this. I'm in elementary school. Your actions, your words, when you're a mom, the way you handle your kids, when you're at work, the way you talk to your coworkers, those little things can make all the difference in the world where someone goes, I want what you have, and they may ask. And that may be the thing that gets them here one day. And that may be the thing that allows somebody else to show them a little bit more and help them grow. And one day they'll look back and it won't be that. It won't be the pastor that baptized them. It won't be all that stuff that changed. And they'll look back and remember the day that you boosted them all. And that will be a life change for them. To me, that's the Great Commission. And when Jesus walked out and said, this is it, do it, that's your one job. It's what you got to do every day of your life. Would you pray with me? God, what a... A heavy word that we just got put on us today. And, uh, and I need to hear it. Because it's so easy to live our life full of such busyness. And, and yet here you are. On our time. Loving on us. So God help us to understand that we can be mosquitoes for you. That we can annoy people. We can buzz around. And we can make a difference. And then just let us know. Take that weight off of us God. Because I need it off of me. That I don't have to do everything. That we don't have to do everything. But that you ask us to be our part. That while we are here in a nation that the disciples never even knew would exist. We can make people know and love you. So God, I thank you so much for that. I thank you for these hearts here, God. And all the hearts that they're going to touch one day. They're going to look back and thank them for the changes they've made. So God, lift us up. Give us energy and make us feel like we can do your work. So in your son's mighty name we pray. Amen.